greetings to you all. I first of all would like to thank each one of you for taking our time from your schedules for our webinar today. We are finally here for the much awaited, much hyped session of discussion, which is all about uh, addressing gender bias in artificial intelligence with Dr. Emily J. Barnes. Dr. Emily is an AI and machine learning developer. She has also spent 15 years in higher education experience and currently working as a Chief Digital Learning Officer at Lindenwood University. So Dr. Emily, if you would like to give us a brief introduction about yourself to begin with this session. Mm, yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me. So again, my name is Dr. Emily Barnes, and I have spent most of my career in higher education, but it's always been through the lens of technology and how to maximize its use in universities. So as technology has continued to evolve and change, um, for me as a machine learning developer and AI expert, um, I've had the opportunity to experience many of the topics that we'll discuss today in this presentation, and I have explored some ways to intervene. Um, and just, I guess, as a forewarning, I'm very passionate about this topic and the role that women take in the world of technology. So I can't wait to share it with you. True. Awesome. Awesome. So let's not wait any further and explore both the technical aspects and societal implications of gender bias in artificial intelligence and analyze as to how this bias reflects societal stereotypes in machine learning. So Dr. Emily, the floor is all yours now. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay, well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this presentation. Our topic, again, is addressing gender bias in AI, understanding the impact and the ways forward. So if you're ready, um, I'm definitely ready to get started uh, presenting on this topic. So in this presentation, we will discuss generations of AI bias, um, gender bias in machine learning, the underrepresentation of women in technology, the factors contributing to bias in AI, manifestations of bias in everyday AI, what we're used to, to interacting with, what we can do to move forward, and why it matters and why it should matter to all of us. So again, thank you for being here today. So let's get started. Um, to begin this conversation on bias in AI and understanding the societal implications of bias, we must first explore the past um, while keeping an ever open eye on the future. And what you see on the screen is a timeline showing when AI, machine learning, and deep learning, and the next ways of AI show up in literature, research, and in application. The dates on this timeline are not exact, um, but the reason why we are looking at AI in a timeline is to, is to view the development of these different technologies as a generation, something separate from one another. Often we, when we talk about AI or machine learning, it's, these terms can become interchangeable. Um, but they're not, they're very different. So we're going to start by discussing the differences here um, and then doing so, but in a, in a looking over the span of time. So over time, each generation has evolved from the previous, just like generations of humans and within families, starting with the timeline, uh, which spans the middle of the page here. Artificial intelligence is really just an ideal. It's an idea that um, the creation of machines can think, reason, and solve problems the way that humans do. This concept is not necessarily tied to a specific technology, uh, but it is a broad idea that makes its appearance in the 1950s uh, by John McCarthy. So in the late 50s and 60s, we see down here, machine learning appears as a science for developing algorithms for computer systems. Uh, what it does is extract knowledge from patterns and data and performs tasks without precise instructions. Right after, we see deep learning. Uh, it came into view in the 1990s and is now on stage as a subset of machine learning that focuses on algorithms modeled from the human brain uh, using the term neural networks um, that can be processed, that, can, that processes information like the human brain. Deep learning is what most consumers are familiar with, what most all of us are familiar with, because and most of our products and services like digital assistants or voice enabled remotes or credit fraud detection, home AIs uh, and software systems, we are already interacting with this type of AI on a regular basis. Um, and it's in emerging technologies such as self-driving cars. Next on our list is gener generative AI or gen AI. And it started in the 60s, but really came into view uh, to the mainstream in early 2000s as a subset of deep learning, focusing on generating new data, new content, text, audio, imagery, et cetera. 
this type of AI is a public trained AI, meaning that many members of society has contributed to its development. Up on the top again here um, on the slide is explainable AI. Um, it's already here. Many of us don't interact with it yet because it's not yet mainstream. Um, it's a derivative of previous technologies. So all these four that came before it, this AI advancement is considered to be human readable, meaning that uh, it's expected to be able to explain how it thinks, making it more transparent. Um, and we will interact with this AI much differently than we do um, previous iterations of AI. Lastly, and at the bottom there, you'll see neuromorphic AI. Uh, it's designed to mimic the brain, but also the neurosystem. So huge advancement in AI that's projected to come out about 2025, 2026. And this AI is expected to be able to read facial features and interact more intimately than others have in the past. Uh, so less prompting and more interacting uh, will occur with this AI. But that's not the critical part. So the most critical part for us to really understand is that each of these is a generational leap in AI, um, and they were formed separately. They didn't start as new technologies or from scratch, um, but each generation kept original constructs. And those constructs um, has prevailed through each generation of AI, each keeping a bit of the previous. Um, in terms of bias, we have, you know, to say it, oh, I say fairly directly, is that we've unwittingly baked bi biases into AI systems um, by training them with biased data or with rules that's been created by experts with implicit biases. So now that we have seen generations of AI evolve, what happened in machine learning in the 1950s and 60s is still lingering throughout these different types of AI throughout time. So in terms of violent, uh, sorry, in terms of bias, especially hereditary bias, just like humans, um, it's in algorithms. The original source of the bias can prevail from one generation to the next. We've all witnessed this with our families and friends. The training and testing data, evaluation processes and output capabilities that shape machine learning practices in the 50s and 60s are still in some respect influencing how we're using AI today and how it operates today. And even though machine learning was in the 60s, we still see it in generative AI, which is two leaps forward from machine learning. So many of us view AI as neutral, but it's not um, because humans have made AI and made AI to mimic humans and to act like humans and to think like humans. So all the biases that humans have and that we've internalized um, shows up in AI, including gender bias, which is what we're talking about today. So going back to our timeline, you can also see that there are some societal changes that have occurred um, along the timeline as AI has been developing. And one of those is the very first automatic analytical computer, uh, which was invented in 1830 uh, by a man named Charles Babbage. Now, what's interesting about this is that while Char Charles Babbage made the machine, um, it was a stepping stone. But the first calculating machine algorithm was invented by Ada Lovelace. And many of you may know who that is, maybe some don't, but she was a 27-year-old woman that in the 1840s, she wrote a document entitled Note G. And in this document, Ada wrote the processes that she believed um, Babbage's calculating machine computed numbers, um, making her the very first machine, um, or sorry, the very first computer programmer. So Ada, who was friends with Babbage at the time, is said to have recognized the potential for his machine to process musical notes, letters, images, and she launched the next 100 years of modern computing and she became the very first computer programmer. So now in 2024, we still see a much very, a very different world of technology, um, a field and industry that's desperately trying to recruit women. And because they need to be more uh, inclusive, you know, we're trying to combat global problems. So, you know, what happened? Um, what happened from the time when the first the first computer programmer was a woman uh, in the 1840s, which is a very long time ago, to now where we are in terms of modern technology? So there's many factors um, that we can speak to simply, which is globalization, colonization, the spread of Western belief systems, 
emphasis on the roles of women in the household. Um, because roughly 130 to 150 years later, after Ada, um, in the 1960s and 70s in the U.S., boys and girls were tested in public schools for, uh, they were tested with a uh, a standardized exam that taught, or sorry, that tested for skills and performance. So the results of the standardized exam showed women to be less capable in math and sciences and more capable um, than men in writing. So I won't bury the lead, but the number of males to females that took this exam was 13 to 1. So huge societal implications came from an exam where men were, rep were represented 13 to 1 over women. So how does that affect, you know, the next two generations? I'll, you know, I'll tell you, at one, at one point in our history, an entire generation of women were deemed masculine for exhibiting math and science skills. If they were logical or more analytical, they were masculine. Same thing for men who were belittled uh, for having feminine characteristics, which at the time meant writing, music, singing, dancing, um, studying the humanities. And now that whole generation, you know, that changed how um, professions that people went into, the disciplines they studied in college. For example, the millennials in the extra generation now in their 30s and 40s are still fighting this gender bias because they were raised by women who said, I'm not good at math and science. So what happened today is that women, you know, the children of these women flock towards humanities, disciplines, history, music. Uh, the arts, men went into manufacturing, machining, engineering, science, because that's what they were told. So now we're still fighting this fight. Uh, but again, we have a chance to uh, reverse some of these, some of these problems that are now lingering across generations um, as societal norms. You know, if we look at today's view and finish these last two points on the slide here, ChatGPT was developed by a woman and still only 26% of women are employed in tech positions. And that's a recent statistic. So it's not that it's a matter of skills or abilities, but it is a matter that we need to address. And for me, of course, I'm here because I'm, I've always attempt to recruit women to STEM um, because the influence that women can have on technology is profound in terms of, of serving an entire generation and, to, and entire society uh, with technology. So to summarize this slide, um, if biases in AI is left uncorrected, the same biases instilled in technologies years ago will carry forward into the future and will continue to limit opportunity that AI brings us all. Let me keep going here. Excuse me why I switched my slides. Okay. So let's discuss gender bias in machine learning. Uh, and I, I start here for a reason, but I'm not going to go deep into machine learning and how it works. But what you were looking at on the slide is a very abridged, uh, condensed version of a machine learning model uh, in, in graphical form. It's greatly simplified for this presentation for those who are who are looking at this machine uh, learning model um, and, and trying to pick it apart. But um, I'm showing you this so that we can understand how many opportunities a human has to influence the results of data accuracy, uh, predictions, and outcomes of machine learning algorithms, which again is in, is part of every uh, generation of AI at this point. There are three main types of AI bias. There's data bias, algorithm bias, and user interaction bias. But to start with a very, very simple example, Let's say we have a data set. So I want you to imagine a data set here. If you're able to see the screen, it can be structured data, unstructured data. That part is not necessarily what we're focused on here, but data is collected by humans, okay? And it's assembled into a data set and labels, features, it's organized, it's clean, it's translated, it's interpreted, and a data set is uh, ultimately prepared. So once the pre-processed data is ready to go, it's divided into a training and testing set, okay? And it goes through the learning algorithm. When, when we're working through machine learning, we are also tuning um, the algorithm. We're trying to make it better, trying to make it work, trying to get better results. So you see my little human here. That's one more opportunity for a human to intervene because humans are now influencing how an algorithm is tuned, how it works, what features it's seeking. Uh, so we have another instance of bias integration here. 
Same thing with down here, this little guy near the trained model. You know, when we look at machine learning all the way through the evaluation of the performance, you know, is this a good algorithm? Did it do what I want it to do? Did it produce the results I want? Does it work with my data set? All the way through how we interpret the results. You know, what do the results mean? Another human. And then how we form conclusions of that data. Another human. So these are just very basic steps where humans intervene um, and interact with the data and, and the algorithm. Um, and thus, they're able to, uh, if, if accidentally in purpose or just by happenstance, influence um, data and its results. So if there are holes in the data, there are holes in the model. Um, machine learning is led by humans, which means that their own biases will be incorporated throughout the entire AI system. Again, this is a, a very bare bones model, but this is how and why biases occur in AI. It starts with the very beginning um, and continues through the entire cycle. So now that we're switching gears just a little bit, I want to talk about women in technology. So women, well, you know, underrepresentation of women technology, women are largely underrepresented in computing, digital information technology, engineering, mathematics, and physics, uh, largely the STEM discipline as a whole. Um, currently, 12% of AI researchers are women, 22% are AI professionals, and 26% of STEM positions are held by women. The problem is prevalent worldwide, uh, and it's seen in many different ways. Some women having less access to technology, girls not having access to technology in schools, um, workplace and employment opportunities. They have less decision-making power, less presence in technology teams, in companies forming AI solutions, in building AI technology, you name it, women are less represented as a whole. So gender bias then can prevail uh, because one, it's just it's simple human nature. It's very easy to overlook uh, in a population that's not staring, basically staring at you from across the table, right? Project table or board table uh, in the boardroom. But it's not just the fact that women are underrepresented. There's many other factors contributing to bias in AI. We'll talk about those. So looking at AI technologies through a very broad lens, uh, there are a few themes or um, factors contributing to bias in AI. One is historical data uh, that was used to train these models, perpetuating uh, a continued bias throughout data. Um, if the bias, if the if the data set, excuse me, if the data set um, is unequally representing a specific population, or if there's overfitting to a particular feature, meaning that the data is so off tilt that an undesirable machine learning behavior is occurring when the machine learning model gives like an accurate prediction of the data. Um, second is the misuse and misalignment of the model or the chosen algorithm. So we can ask ourselves, did, did the human analyzing the data choose the correct algorithm? You know, that's question number one. Um, were they using numerical data for a categorical algorithm, for example? Uh, was the data encoded properly? Did the researcher accidentally over or underfit the data? Um, the alignment and accuracy within the algorithm itself is vital to producing optimal results. So. You know, at this point, I can expect any AI expert to be able to determine whether or not an algorithm is likely to produce biased results. Um, but when asked, you know, can they answer? So that's where we come to the lack of awareness. So third here, the lack of awareness. You know, AI systems designed for a diverse public um, must be tested and trained for a diverse public. Um, what's gone wrong in the past is that you know, these mainstream technologies have been trained and tested based off of a very secluded group of people or a dominant group of people. Um, thus, you know, it's going to tilt the data uh, one way or another. So there's automatically bias um, produced in the algorithm. So we have four, we have unpredictive, or sorry, unproductive policy. So companies, businesses, Analysts are still so so far and few that there is still very limited regulation on AI algorithms and machine learning uh, as a whole, just very limited governance. So there's not an insurance for fairness. There's not a governance that that is monitoring fairness in the use of these systems or how algorithms are put together and how data sets are analyzed. So it really is still a right now, it's still a game for capitalism to produce 
a profit of some sort. There is still uh, products that are greatly influenced by these these different types of of algorithms that again are um, I'm going to call it like a it's almost like a, a free for all um, situation among different companies and entities. So, and this would be fine, except for these products impact consumers well outside of their business plans. So they may be selling a software system or um, a product that's relevant to a company because it serves a purpose. But then the people who are experiencing that bias or experiencing the results of the system are usually the people who are also consumers of the business. So lastly, um, I called it the short game here, but it's short-sightedness or playing the short game. You know, these advances in AI are not undergoing uh, any type of rigor um, by any means. Um, producers are quick to market without testing. They're not gathering inclusive feedback. They're not ensuring fairness. Um, it's a short game um, playing with generational lifetimes and significant, and significant societal impact. You know, you have, you have a, uh, a resource that can now be turned into a product and go to a mainstream market with very little regulations in place. So right now, if you look at this full scope, it's not, it's not like there's a 50 year plan, you know, um, sitting on somebody's desk to remove bias from AI and society. So there's not a lot of forethought and uh, forward motion planning involved when it comes to generating AI systems. So how does this appear in products and industries? It's a good segue. Let me go to the next slide. So now we're going to talk about the manifestation of bias in everyday AI. So over the next few slides, um, we'll discuss how bias and AI appear across industry sections, um, and I'll provide a, a brief case study for each. Okay. And we'll start with um, manifestation of, bi of AI and AI bias in medicine, excuse me, tongue twister. So in 2007, IBM created Watson for Oncology. And Watson was an AI system designed to help healthcare workers recommend cancer treatments uh, that were trained on data from American patients and hospitals. So, I mean, logically, it's producing medical recommendations that are dismissing alternative forms of medicine and are recommend, recommending American treatments. So another example of this is an algorithm designed to help healthcare providers assess the likelihood of women having safe vaginal um, delivery. So this algorithm was incorrect and predicted that a large majority of Black and African American women, uh, Hispanic and Latino women, were less likely to have successful vaginal births after a C-section than non-Hispanic white women. So the results of this um, Ultimately, the result ended with more women having C-sections than um, more Black and African-American women and Hispanic and Latino women having C-sections than white women. So let's talk about bi um, bias in the workplace. Um, and this is a, um, a case study from Amazon, Amazon's AI recruiting tool. While selecting top candidates during the hiring process, Amazon's automated resume screening system was shown to discriminate against women. The data used um, that they used to train the recruitment model was informed by resume samples from a 10 year period. So they're using historical data to project best fit for these new positions. And women were largely underrepresented in this data set. The resume screening model um, was using linguistic signals. So, and it was associated with successful male candidates. So you have a data system, or sorry, a data set that has successful male candidate resumes and the, 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 the AI model was trained from this set. And once the bias was discovered, Amazon did discard the model, but before that, it affected everything from the advertisement of positions, um, even in ads like Facebook, Google, AdWords, um, Instagram, and Twitter advertisements. Um, they were positioned for, for, for men to be more likely to see those ads because the machine was was trying to gather the results it it was trained to to look for. Amazon had abandoned its AI recruiting tool because it was found to be biased against women. Um, the system was trained on resumes submitted to um, previously, but it was highlighting words where women had went to women's colleges. So if there was a a women's group or a women's college or 
women's organization listed on the resume, it was um, automatically declined because that's what the, the model was looking for. So now AI and finance or AI bias and finance. Financial institutions, um, which are traditionally known to be biased against minority groups, um, are, you know, as, as more AI is made available to the industry, they're becoming more reliant on AI systems for improving operational efficiency overall. This could be loan approvals or um, investment decisions, but AI systems are being used to approve loans and they have been found to discriminate against certain demographic groups. So this bias in AI technology is likely to amplify bias against minorities, especially in an industry that already is known to do so. So like most AI systems in the banking sector, they're relying on historical data. And again, with historical data, we're also leaning towards a, a largely more, more wealthy elite, um, consumers that have more wealth than others. So there's automatically um, bias in the data set just simply because of the population that it's screening. Um, this, this bias resulted from the algorithm's behavior um, it had a wider reach as far as um, securing loans, um, investments for wealthy white consumers over all others. So let's talk about bias in the home or AI bias in the home. And this is something that most of us is very familiar with, but may not think about. And it's, it's kind of a fun topic. So effective labor is going to be the word that we, or the term that we discuss, but domesticated and feminized forms of AI are also you know, um, find their way into our homes. For example, uh, Alexa, you know, have any of us ever wondered why Alexa is a female name with a female voice and, and was selected to be the, the voice, I guess, and the name for the home AI. So these home, these home AIs are performing something called effective labor, um, conventionally expected of women to perform in a household. So the gendered work of effective labor involves things like um, producing and managing lists, uh, making appointments, managing the calendar. Um, you can make a shopping list from your kitchen now. You can say, hey, Alexa, you know, order me another round of whatever and have it delivered to your home. So a lot of this um, with AIs in the house, they're doing a lot of activities related to caring and listening and comforting and reassuring. Um, for those of you who have an AI in your house, um, my AI will will sing an I love you song to my kids. You know, if they say, hey, um, you know, Alexa, I love you. And then she'll sing a little song or um, make jokes when they want to hear something funny. And all of those things are related to, you know, what does an, a domestic AI supposed to be doing? Now, these home-based virtual assistants such as Alexa, um, Cortana, and then Siri, they perform this effective labor by managing both data and emotions. And I would say what's very interesting about this is that these voice interfaces are really designed to perform tasks like uh, reminding, making lists, seeking information, taking notes, for example. And they are living some of these realities of women in the household, but they're doing so without getting frustrated. They're never stressed out. They're never uh, impatient. They're never mean. Um, they never say the wrong thing, right? Because they're designed not to. Um, but where where I think the conflict comes into play is that you have these feminized domestic AIs that are now per, that are now performing duties in a household, but they never get stressed out. You know, so they're they're the perfect they're the perfect solution, right, to the household problem. So. Where this comes, where the problems tend to line up for um, an AI in the home is that, for example, Google, they have a speech recognition software that was found to be 70% more likely um, to interpret a male's voice over a female's, which is very interesting because, you know, we have female voiced AIs. So this, this bias, you know, how does this affect women, you know, because it does it give does it provide a disadvantage uh, in the workplace? Does it um, familiarize children, households with gender roles um, stereotypically related to women? Does it perpetuate a female's voice in the household as something soft and reassuring, um, creating more safety around kids and women? Does it, does it unequally harm men 
um, in some way, shape, or form because we're perpetuating stereotypes by saying this is not the role of a male to smile and to comfort and to nurture uh, when obviously it is for all the dads who are listening. So in domestication of AI, this has extended beyond even just the the female voice you have coming from the counter, but even in terms of um, you know how how these AIs are targeting advertisements, how they are, you know, um, what voices they're picking up. I mean, I would say faces, but not yet. Um, but how they're interacting with family and children and how is that shaping, you know, children as they grow and develop and uh, familiarize themselves with the modern world versus, you know, what's expected of them as far as their gender roles and household, you know, household roles. So that's a that's a totally another topic all on its own, but it's an interesting one. Okay. So let's talk about um, bias, AI bias in education. So many, many new systems are on, again, they're, they're um, on the market. And, you know, as someone who's coming from the world of higher education, I can tell you that we have, an, there's an AI system for everything, for tutoring, for enrollment, for recommending uh, majors, for example, which is one we're going to talk about today. but Many of these technologies are employing machine learning techniques of some sort, um, and the AI systems that they're recommending, or the AI systems they're recommending and perpetuating stereotypes. You know, we're learning from them and we see them, but you know, for a college major recommendation, if an AI is performing that, trying to help a student figure out what major they're in, is this AI system biased? Is it in, is it recommending stereotypical? Um, majors for students based on their gender or their age or their um, sexual orientation. You know, so looking at this full scope through a lineup of products, you know, right now, this is one of the the a huge conversation as far as in higher education with these systems upon implementation. Are these systems going to be counterproductive as far as ensuring that students have um you know, solid recommendations, that they are pursuing the right things, that they're interacting in a way that, you know, the student is desiring and what's good for their career versus how the AI has been trained. Um, so that's a large conversation today. Let's see, let's talk about a way forward. So I believe that there are several actions that everyone can take. Um, a consumer, uh, a leader, a professional, a business owner, uh, you name it, anyone interacting with the economy can do something um, that will support mitigating AI bias in some way, shape, or form. Now, but this slide here is from a professional lens. So very, very simple tactics. Um, you can include a diverse body of people to review and supervise the, the data cleaning and pre-processing process. Um, there can be Groups of people, diverse groups of people who are ensuring that they're, that the um, algorithmic bias is kept at a minimum, that the data bias is kept at a minimum. Um, there's always a little bit of bias, right? But, you know, having diverse faces and diverse people interacting on a team will help all voices be heard simply because humans just are flawed. Um, second would be you know, conduct bias auditing and produce assessment plans. Um, right now, again, we talked about it's not really regulated. It's, it's still kind of a free-for-all. So how can companies uh, implement policies and practices that will help mitigate bias for their product, for their employees, um, for the families that are consumers of their good or service? Um, and there's, again, I think with auditing procedures and assessment plans, you can evaluate yeah, you know, so evaluate biases, or sorry, evaluate AI for unfairness, for bias, for um, unequal representation overall. Uh, the next one is establish ethical guidelines and policies. So there's companies right now that are forming uh, things like frameworks for ethical decision making, um, ethical reviews, ethical policies as far as how we treat data, um, what we're looking for, how features are organized identified which algorithms are used, and then how bias is um, evaluated in the results. Disclosing 
machine learning model usage. Uh, that's a big topic that no one really wants to, I think that one is, is highly avoided at this time, mostly because of prior, um, either proprietary um, knowledge or use or practice as far as their data and how they arrive at their results. You know, people don't want to share that, businesses don't want to share that information, but that's a critical piece of having transparency with the community, knowing that what you're utilizing and how you're utilizing it is as bias-free as possible. Uh, so that's a major area that needs to be addressed today. The next would be to plan regular updates and new training data. So just because it's always been there doesn't mean it has to continue. So retraining, reforming, new data sets, fresh eyes, fresh lens, utilizing new techniques uh, can mitigate bias. Um, third party, we'll go with third party audit, third party auditors, um, having external review teams um, to check your work. I know it sounds a little like a little silly, but checking your works is in AI is critical. Um, having an external review team who are unbiased, who are not familiar with the data, who are not looking at your systems from away from a, making a profit or meeting a consumer need or getting you know a, a gold star with the boss, having an external review team uh, provide transparent feedback um, is is another way. Again, releasing data sets for public inspection, uh, conducting the conversation of bias in AI. So when I say this is critical for everybody, um, I think right now, this is my professional and personal opinion that every family, every coworker, every book club, um, every classroom should be discussing bias in AI uh, and how we interact with AI and how it affects society. So now at this time, and I think in our society in this big pivotal change, having those types of conversations um, are really important as far as how as a society, we want to address some of the things that we're seeing. And then having equalized data sets for mass audiences. Um, you know, for me, it's it's very simple. If you are creating a product or results or a service um, and you're using machine learning, your data sets need to represent the people who you're serving, um, making sure that all that data is provided um, and to gather it where possible. So again, this is from a professional perspective, but we might get to, um, you know, um, well, I'll leave one, you know, think about like the everyday consumer. Not everybody is, a, is in, in a business or owns a business or works for a company that utilizes machine learning. Uh, so I think the very basic thing for any consumer to do uh, on a regular basis is demand that transparency from the companies that you're giving money to. So if you are purchasing a product or a service and you know that algorithms are used, AI is used, um, demand that transparency. Um, and this is going to sound really blunt and very direct, but if a company is unwilling to do that, um, the only way that you can make your voice heard as an average consumer is to not give them your money. So if this is something that we're dedicated to fixing and to making uh, better for the future, um, it is it is one of those topics where I know for my family, we feel very strongly. So we make decisions about where we put our resources um, and why it matters. Next slide. So why does this matter? Um, here on this slide, you're gonna see two columns. Uh, one is everyone, you know, why does it matter to everyone? And then why does it matter for women and girls uh, in particular? So, um, excuse me, the importance of addressing bias and artificial intelligence, um, obviously it can't be overstated. It's something I care about deeply. Um, the lack of attention to this issue has profound implications for our society in multiple ways. And I'll talk about the first one. So fairness and equity. AI systems are increasingly used in decision-making processes that affect human lives, such as hiring, lending, law enforcement, uh, and healthcare, you know, some of the other areas that we discussed. If these systems are biased, uh, they can perpetuate and even um, enhance or, or expand existing societal in, uh, inequalities. So ensuring fairness in AI helps promote equity and prevents discrimination against certain groups based on gender, race, age, and other characteristics. Uh, the second is accuracy and reliability. So this affects everyone, but 
bias AI can lead to inaccurate or misleading outcomes. You know, for instance, uh, facial recognition software, um, a system trained predominantly on one racial group may perform poorly on others, leading to misidentification or unfair treatment. Uh, it happens often in airports or airlines. Um, people are profiled or singled out because of their, their race or their features uh, because a system didn't approve of their, you know, di didn't register their face. So that can be a problem. So ensuring that we have diversity in our training sets and algorithm is crucial to accuracy and reliability. Third is public trust and adoption. So public perception of AI is critical um, as far as its widespread adoption. If AI is seen as biased or unfair, then we're gonna reduce users, um, have less attention given, have less interaction with this technology and all the opportunity they can provide. So the lack of trust in these technologies um, will hinder potential benefits. So ensuring AI systems are unbiased and transparent is key to building and maintaining this public trust. Number four is legal and compliance. So as awareness of AI bias grows, so thank you for listening, uh, governments and organizations are increasingly enacting laws and guidelines to ensure ethical AI usage, but we're not there. Um, again, we're lacking in-house governance um, as far as even industry governance, expectations of quality or fairness are not yet implemented across all sectors and is now going to perpetuate more discrimination um, overall. Number five is the economic implications. So biased AI systems, they have economic consequences. So if we have failure of products, Value of services, legal, legal liabilities, companies that deploy biased AI, risk reputational damage, loss of customers, uh, potential legal challenges, um, and all of these have financial impact um, as far as you know, uh, looking at a business overall. The next would be number six for everyone is innovation and creativity. So diverse and unbiased AI can lead to more innovation and creative solutions. Now, there's plenty of people who argue with me on that, but... Uh, right now, you know, if we're considering a wider range of perspectives and experiences, AI systems can can be developed to meet these broader broader needs of the user base and be more inclusive uh, and have a better technological design. Seventh is the global perspective. So, in an increasingly interconnected world, we still see a lot of inequalities um, inequalities by location, by gender, by role, um, by by sector, uh, by class. And as these AI systems are deployed globally, addressing this bias ensures these systems are sensitive to cultural and social and also regional differences. Um, and right now, those are those areas um, or competencies of AI are, are falling short, um, to say it succinctly. So lastly is the impact of bias um, on women and girls uniquely. Um, so we'll just ask, we'll ask it in, in the form of a question. So does, does bias in AI reinforce gender stereotypes? You know, you could probably answer these in your head as I read them. Um, how does bias contribute to discrimination of employment and, and career advances where even without AI, it's already there, right? Which is just regular bias. Um, how does it impact healthcare? You know, we talked about two, two different case studies where AI systems were um, unequally evaluating, you know, recommendations for healthcare. So how does it, how does it impact healthcare globally? Educational disparities. We already know that women and girls, um, have less educational opportunities than boys and men. Uh, so how does bias and AI perpetuate that same, a same continuous problem? Looking at social and psychological impact, you know, I think, Just a quick pause when I think I, the way that women view themselves, the way that girls view their opportunities, the way that they perceive um, how, how far they can go in their life, how, how much their career can grow um, right now is still, is still something that's limited based on access to resources. You know, so how does uh, bias and AI contribute to stereotypes, uh, how a woman views their identity or how a young girl might 
perceive their ability to reach for this additional role or this um, uh, higher career um, based on it because AI or, or there's bias in AI. So also limitation of women's voices in technology development and then global consequences. So women and girls, again, um, with bias in AI, it's not all women. Um, it can be all genders, all races, all ethnicities um, are, are struggling with this today. So acting today, um, I believe as a, in some, acting today can change the future of AI and everyone can be and should be dedicated to contributing what they can um, to a future that's free of bias in AI. And that is, that's the end of my presentation today, but I'm open for questions. Wow. Am I seen now, by the way? Um, am I visible? Um, so I went a little off. I, I, I was um, just following up with the presentation and uh, trust me, I actually thank, uh, you know, myself for not being live on, or on video while you were um, stating facts, to be honest, uh, you know, in the presentation. Um, because I was just going like, wow, wow. Like, it, I think every slide, we were just coming across a truth, you know, uh, in the end. That's because I think we subconsciously have been ignoring a lot of these things. These are some small, intricate, you know, things, details around uh, um, AI, in the world of AI, I would say. So, I mean, uh, personally, I learned a lot, but at the same time, I feel that, uh, you know, it's, it's, it starts at the ground level, like, you know, the basic foundation, the blocks, the building blocks, uh, from that to what we're taking into generations ahead. I think it's, it's just impacting a lot of these elements in the process. So, that is something which is very enlightening, to be honest. That's because that is something I think we've been ignor ignoring, uh, you know, these small details. Um, and uh, I thank God. I, I thank personally that I was not visible. That's because I was like, what? I cracked up a lot on, uh, you know, when you said uh, bias at home. I think that, that was that was something which, which I probably was very random, you know. Um, we totally don't understand that it's comforting and it's calming, you know, subconsciously it's Alexa for us, it's Siri for us. So, you know, we we sort of have that. And why a woman's, you know, voice uh, comforting and, you know, uh, just, just making us happy or doing our task, you know, listing out those things. So I think I, I personally learned a lot from the session and um, I do have a couple of questions, by the way, for you. Um, I'm sure you've covered a lot of it in the presentation, but just to understand uh, from a third person perspective, uh, how does this gap, you know, in female representation impact the technologies that are built? What do you what do you suggest? Um, so. Let's see. Um, the gap in female representation, I think, impacts technologies built by introducing gender biases into AI systems. So I think it leads to products and services that may not fully address or accurately represent the needs um, of women, the needs of a diverse population or user base. Um, you know, I think that there's opportunities missed uh, because there's a gap in representation uh, where it's needed as far as, you know, where, where AI is being formed, being built, being created. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, from a bias at workplace, uh, I have one more question around it. That is, what strategies uh, can organizations implement to ensure diversity and inclusion in AI development teams? That's a, that's a, that's a big question. Um, can you say it one more time, please? Sure. So what mm -hmm. strategies can organizations implement to ensure diversity and inclusion in AI development teams. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as far as what what companies can do and businesses can do, um, you know, we, we did discuss some, but looking for looking for strategies to counteract um, gender imbalance um, 
And this can be across any sector of business, um, implementing additional security measures as far as um, screening tools. Um, for example, IBM has a, a new suite of awareness and debiasing tools for, for certain classifiers. There's the um, there's something called Lime. Um, it's a logical interpretable, mo interpretable model, excuse me, um, for explanations. And I think that having having things like frameworks in place for decision making, uh, making sure that diverse groups are at the table where decisions are made and where results are discussed, um, and then even at the formation. Um, so well before then, you know, embarking upon a new project or things like that, that's where you want to make sure that you have representation where it's needed so that you have a more robust product. It's not necessarily that it can't be a good product or a good service without it, but to do things, I think the best way, meaning that you have, you've checked your boxes, you have, um, you've done your screening, you've been conscientious about your decisions, uh, and you've made effort to keep things as inclusive as possible is going to yield a better result overall. Perfect. Right. And I, I sort of um, agree with that. I, I think when you were talking, talking about uh, inspection and third party audits, you know, just to maintain the fairness and um, uh, probably more transparency, you know, when you're, but that's again, a bunch of humans doing their job and then how influence comes as one of these, you know, uh, factors as adding on to bias, you know, adding on to the data that we are collecting at the same time. So, uh, or assessing at the same time. So yeah, it does make a difference. Well, and it is last... very new. Sorry, sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm, I'm just going to say, elaborate a little bit. It is very new. Yeah. Uh, you know, higher, higher education, we have accrediting bodies. Uh, financial institutions, large businesses, medium businesses have audits, yearly audits. Um, these are all practices that have been in place for years um, for more established institutions or more established disciplines and fields. But right now, AI is still, it's uh, it's a little bit more free than that. So there's right. there's things coming into play, but not yet have we formed structure around governing AI from the base, from the base roots of AI. True. There are no factors that are probably keeping checkpoints, you know, in between when everything is going into a, a play, maybe it's just rolling free, like you just said. So um, one last question that we have from our site, that is, um, you know, what steps by different groups, that is consumers, leaders, teachers, business owners, machine learning developers uh, can be taken to counteract the biases found in AI systems across different sectors, such as healthcare, finance, and employment. We've already touched upon that, I think, in the presentation, but then how do you suggest, you know, we what steps can be taken by all of these people, you know, in, in places? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I mean, regardless of the group, um, a variety of individuals can take. There's so many different things that you can do, I think, on a regular basis. Um, I mean, you can advocate for and implement bias training at your workplace. You can make sure that any AI, um, it could be an AI strategic team or AI ambassadors, whatever it is that you're doing at, at your company or within your workplace or classroom or home, wherever it may be, um, making sure that those teams are diverse um, in, in all areas of AI development, um, putting in ethical frameworks for ethical decision-making uh, is very important, but also, you know, putting in bias mitigation into project plans. You know, so if you're embarking upon a new project or strategic intent, how do you, um, from the very beginning, implement measures and, and security and layers of, of anti-bias mitigation or mitigation, medication, we'll call it medication along the way. <laughs> um, you know, I think for, you know, I talked about this on that slide, but for consumers, so think about like the average consumer, you know, you're, you get up in the morning, you're taking your kids to school. Okay. You're, um, you know, going to your work day or, or whatever it may be, you're coming home and you're in, a, you're getting, a, you're going to the dentist, you're going to the doctor, you're going to the store, wherever, wherever, and whatever it is, um, with all those interactions between services and products, I, 
I truly believe that most consumers do not have a voice. So if you want to have a voice, you really do control that voice uh, and how loud it's heard with where you put your resources. So part of the reason why uh, you see companies altering their advertisements or their strategy um, to make their intent clear or their mission clear or their belief systems clear is because many consumers are very conservative with how they, um, you know, where they're going to buy a product or buy a service. And if you're committed to transparent AI usage, which would also be transparent with bias, then you're really controlling what companies do hmm. uh, because you're either are or are not giving them your money and you are or are not using their services. So I think every consumer no matter what they make or what they do, they have significant power to control um, and take a role in mitigating AI bias. I think it's allocation or maybe invest investing in the right resources for that matter. That maybe channelize, you know, the way AI would take notes in future. So Super. Do you have um, anything else that you would want to touch upon before we end the session? Yeah, well, just just one little thing. So I was thinking of it when you just asked me that question. But um, as an educator um, and as a mother and um, as a professional, I really do feel strongly about if you're not having conversations about AI with your family, you know, that's something you can do today. And <laughs> definitely let your kids lead it. Right. Because that amazing amazing conversation, but conversations at AI in your classroom, every classroom should be having conversations about AI right now, college, third grade, fourth grade, primary school, it doesn't matter what it is, um, because it's going, when I say it's going, um, it's, it's more real to others, um, or more real to some more than others, but AI is so prevalent in everything that we're doing, and it will continue to be so, so having those conversations now, um, I think is critically important to shaping how we look at it later. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree. I think I learned a lot about uh, how we have uh, probably given the opportunity for AI to, you know, impact a lot of things for our future generations and um, how subconsciously we've been avoiding a lot of things that have been built, you know, in the past and then what we've been doing or consuming, you know, in and in the end, and how it's going to impact in future. So that's a good chain that I sort of, you know, um, learned today. <laughs> so thanks to you, thank you so much for this. So I, I would definitely say this was, you know, an insightful session, and um, definitely a need of the hour to address uh to these details you know around gender bias in the world of artificial intelligence um and we at blockchain council you know would like to thank you dr emily for you know um coming on this platform uh, and it's definitely a pleasure and an honor to have you with us um and conduct such a beautiful session on such a sensitive topic you know uh, with us so thank you so much for that and um, at any point of time, any questions that probably from the audiences that we have not addressed, feel free to connect with either of us. You know, we'd be happy to answer them. So, um, and again, you know, thanks again, Dr. Emily. So we thank really you. hope that you have a great evening ahead. And uh, thank you so much for connecting. Thanks so much. Thank you. Super. Thank you.